Um, sorry, there's a plane. Welcome everybody, my name's Dora. If everyone who's here in the chat could drop their name, their pronouns, and then where you're Zooming from. Um, I'm Dora, I use she, her pronouns. I'm Zooming from New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I go to school and I'm currently living for the summer. Hi everyone, I'm Claire. I use she, her pronouns too. I'm also Zooming from Connecticut, but in Madison where I live, 20 minutes away from Dora. Um, thank you all for coming. We're excited to present this to you guys. Um, this whole presentation will probably take less than 30 minutes together. And I just like really want to appreciate people taking their time out of their Saturday summer um, to listen to us. And, and we're just going to like jump right into it. So WeChat project is composed of some people who identify as Chinese Americans and Chinese Americans are at once racialized as spelling bee champions, sexual fetishes, tech geniuses, and apolitical model minorities. There are real differences amongst all of us in class, religion, immigration status, color, gender, sexuality, language, and our political trajectories. We recognize that everyone who wants to be involved with the WeChat project comes from a very different background, um, and especially in talking about our political trajectory. Not all of us are or even consider ourselves Chinese American. And as such, Claire and I really wanted to meet everybody where we are. Because of this, the WeChat project organizers are forced to think deeply at any given moment about the common interests that will animate us in the most expansive and transformative Chinese American politics. We created this series of webinar style lessons to provide our volunteer community and broader community with a space for critical thinking regarding Chinese American identity and how that affects our politics. These first two installments on Chinese American history take that term Chinese American and history as just a point of departure. As truly transnational, anti-imperial and abolitionist frameworks reveal, Chinese American history extends beyond the boundaries of race, of identity and of national geography. We are placing Chinese Americanness in a context of the expansive systems of power that organize broader society. We're talking about capitalism, imperialism, racial domination, gender oppression, labor exploitation, war, and social movements. We're gonna start part one with European encounters with the quote, new world. We're gonna to end today's presentation with the 18th BC California gold rush. Sorry, that's the notifications, I didn't change that. Um, and then next week in part two, we're gonna pick up with the transcontinental railroad possibly, um, and then finish in the present day. Today's teaching will roughly be 15 minutes of presentation and we'll just leave the remainder of the time for open floor Q and A for a total of, as I said, less than 30 minutes. We hope that this history crash course will surprise you, excite you, and motivate you into organizing with us at the WeChat project, or maybe just help you think a little bit more today. So now let's talk about Chinese American history. The guiding question that we have with this presentation is why are there Asian people in America? So Chinese American and Asian American history, if you've ever had the pleasure of being taught and probably you haven't, often begins with Chinese people in the United States who arrived as gold miners or railroad workers who were then discriminated against and then excluded by broader mainstream white society. While all this history is really important and is already under taught, this framing can also be seriously misleading. Starting with free migrants often implies that there is this quote, good Chinese American who can through their self-advocacy assimilate with American and white culture and assert themselves as full citizens. Today, Claire and I want to know what happens when we start Chinese American history, not with free migrants, but with the larger logics of land, labor, and empire that have forcibly driven people from the global south into places like the United States. As we present today, please keep in mind the things that surprise you, upset you, or excite you for our discussion afterwards. So starting here in 1492 with Asia on the mind, Seeking Cathay in the Indies, Columbus, quote, discovered America. He encountered the Dominican Republic and called the local Arawak, Taino, and Carib indigenous peoples, quote, Indians, thinking he had arrived in Asia. European, quote, exploration in what we now know as the Americas was from the very beginning in pursuit of wealth, glory, and a god from Asia at the expense of indigenous erasure. Throughout the 17th and 19th century, took place a variety of European colonizations in Asia. So this video demonstrates a variety of changing flags and color blocks that represent expanding empires. But rather than digging into the specifics of which empire where, Claire and I want to remind you that 
Every time these colors and flags change, land is being stolen from indigenous peoples and individuals are dehumanized and exploited for their labor on these lands. Empire requires land and it requires labor, but empire has not always existed. We are often taught history. We, as in colonized people or people who are interested in the solidarity of colonized people, are often taught history as a predetermined changing of flags as if the world operated on the whims of colonial empires, but it does not. At every turn in history, people resist colonialism. And let's take a look at the Opium Wars as an example of that resistance. Claire? Okay, I'm muting myself. Um, okay, so at this time, um, China was producing a lot of goods that the West really wanted, um, specifically tea, silk, and porcelain. Um, and many of these things we consider to be typically British or New Englander are actually from China. Um, and widespread consumption of Chinese goods in England and the colonies um, combined with China's lack of interest in purchasing Western goods results in a disastrous trade deficit for the British because millions of Mexican silver dollars are pouring in to China from England to pay for Chinese tea and other goods, but none of the Chinese money is going back into the English economy. So Britain's solution to their trade deficit um, with China was to promote the sale of addictive opium. And the British Empire forced their people in their colony um, in India to harvest poppies and produce opium. And that was then smuggled into China for a profit. The United States is at this point also a weak and fledgling country, um, but it also follows the British example because American imports actually account for 10% of all the opium that's smuggled into China. And the British and the Americans flood China with opium in order to build their own wealth. The Chinese are naturally outraged. They begin to seize all the opium in um, a really important port in Canton and they enforce a shutdown and they blockade trading companies. This leads to um, the British being very upset. Um, they use military force, which they term gunboat diplomacy, um, to guarantee the security of their own trade. And they deploy thousands of Indian soldiers brought in from their colony um, to fight on their side. And then China is defeated in the Opium War. Um, it's forced to sign the 1842 Treaty of Nanjing, um, which is between China and Britain. And this opens China to foreign involvement um, by Western powers and later by Japan. Um, China also signs a treaty with the US called the Treaty of Wangsha, and that's in 1844. And this cedes a lot of the same powers and rights to the United States as well. So the Opium Wars result in a spiraling downfall of China and defeat from a previous position of unrivaled world trading power. And that's the colonial tea. What happened to China during the Opium Wars is a perfect example of the term colonialism and for people who maybe haven't engaged with it before. Uh, as defined by the Boston Ethnic Studies Curriculum Writing Group, which is an incredible community organization in Boston, um, colonialism is the system and ideas that name normal or make normal in theory, the domination and control of people who are seen as inferior in order to justify the occupation of their land, the control of their resources, their economy and their politics for the benefit of the colonizer. And as Claire said, that's the tea. Okay, now we're gonna 